Welcome everyone. This meeting is being recorded. It will be published to the Town of Amherst YouTube channel shortly. And I am turning it over to the chair, Professor Austin Serrett. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, Angie, for that warm introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody. We have two members of the public who are in attendance. Uh, we are meeting pursuant to a gubernatorial order that I think is expiring. Is it expiring? When does it expire? Do we July know? 15th. So uh, this may be, I guess, our last uh, JRBC meeting uh, via Zoom, uh, but okay. So I just want to make sure everybody's here and they will uh, can be heard. And uh, if you would signify your attendance when I call your name, Sharon. Here. Christine. Here. Sean. Here. George. Here. Paul. Present. And Austin. So um, we are, we have a quorum. Okay. So the first order of business is the approval of the minutes of June 21st. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you so much. Um, any corrections to the minutes? Okay, uh, vote yes, you approve. No, you don't. Sharon? Yes. Christine? Yes. Thank you. Sean? Yes. Thank you. George? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Austin votes yes. And thank you to Angie for the uh, minutes. So next is a financial, a financial update. But if it's okay, I want to try to clarify something that uh, I think I may have uh, confused a little bit. So we have a proposal from Epsilon Associates to um, uh, help us with historic tax credits. That proposal is addressed as it should be to the Jones Library Board of Trustees. And I, it, it's not uh, for action of this body, but the hope was that we could talk about it and uh, if there are any thoughts about um, what that proposal is, it would inform the conversation that we'll have um, uh, in, in, the board of, in the Board of Trustees. So that's why, it's on the, that's why it's on the agenda. So if it's okay, we'll do it under financial update, the third item, uh, but it's really, Sharon will just kind of present it and it's uh, for your comment and um, whatever thoughts. So Sean? Thanks. So we don't have a Collier's invoice. I don't believe, I don't think we've received the June invoice yet. So there's no um, Collier's invoice to approve. We were going to sort of introduce, um, Craig was going to introduce uh, the budget template that we'll, we'll probably be looking at it on a monthly basis. It's sort of, it's still kind of boring at this phase, but it's probably a good time to um, kind of introduce it and see if there's any questions on it because we'll be looking at it more often. Uh, so Craig, if you want to pull that up or I can pull up the one you sent me, whatever, whatever's easier. Sure. Awesome. Is it okay if I share my screen? Yes, please. Thank you, Craig. Welcome to Craig and to Will. Thank you. Okay. So you should be able to see that now. Yep. So this is what uh, my office and Will's office uses to track finances on projects. So this is the uh, the report that we put out, as Sean mentioned, there's not a whole ton of information on it right now because we are so still so early in the process, at least financially. But I thought I'd take some time to familiarize everyone. It's Great. A, the, the table looks a little daunting, but by the end of this project, I assure you, we'll all be experts. Um, down the left-hand side, it actually spills onto three pages. Down the left-hand side are all the categories of costs and budget that my office um, recommends. And then, um, so it starts off in general, um, we've got the, the building itself is in the, the top position. Then we have fixtures, furnishings, and equipment or fixtures, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, FF&E. Next page, we've got fees. This includes all the professional fees. And, and this is, this lines up with the budget that we've been kind of working from. Uh, the design fees, specialty design fees, our fee is in here for project management, 
um, some investigations, uh, site survey, things of that nature. And then we continue on to expenses. Um, any expense you can imagine, um, doing borings, material testings during construction, um, the cost for the temporary space, it's all in here. Then we get to this last category, which is contingency, which um, you know, for the for the public, you you folks may already be familiar with that, but for the public, what a contingency is is extra money built into the budget to um, handle the cost of unexpected things. Um, and so then here's our total down here in gray is our total project budget. Uh, all of these numbers are in thousands, uh, just so that we you know kind of fit them a little bit better on the page. So 36 million. 36.2 million is the budget. So that's what column A, so that's this first column and then column A, it's basically just the budget. What we started with as our assumptions um, over the course of the project, column B, money will may need to be moved around from one budget line item to another. Some things will be less than we anticipated, some things will be more than we anticipated. If there is money taken out of these contingencies um, that goes into this approved transfers it's something that we review and uh, that gets approved you know by the um, client you guys and then column c is sort of um, a live update to how we've moved money around as needed so project a will uh, column a won't change column b will evolve over the course of the project and then column c gives us kind of like a running status of where we are with our budget and assumptions um d are all of our our D, E, and F are all the costs. So this is how much money that the town has allocated or the client has allocated for the project. And here is a record of those costs as we um, pay for things. So D1, D2, and then D are the contracts. So right now, the only contract that we have fully executed is the project manager's contract. Um, I had our accounting department include the cost estimators, the owner's cost estimators uh, number here, because I think that was, uh, because that's, you know, the number is finalized, even though the contract hasn't actually been signed. I did not include the architects because, not because um, they, they've been doing tons of work, but there are a couple minor um, scopes that have not yet been finalized. And so we don't know what that final number is yet. Um, but once we have that contractor, we'll plug that in there. There are a couple of columns for things that we know about, but we haven't contracted for. Um, as a starting place, we just put the budget numbers in those columns. Uh, but then as things get more, as we start contracting things and finding things, we will uh, update these fields. And then uh, there is the potential for balances. Um, if we budgeted X dollars, it ends up we've contracted, you know, we've got all the scope contracted and we have a surplus, which is a nice place to be. Um, there'll be some money here in this balance column and then that can get moved around as needed um, because there will be some items that, you know, we guessed low and are re-estimated low and we'll have to um, fund those. So that is the quick overview of this document. Does anyone have any questions? And the idea is that each month we'll update this and bring it to uh, this meeting and um, and review it. Great, thank you, Craig. Questions about the budget template? Sean, yeah. So, so Craig, just is one reason why in the contingency um, we kind of show additional need, is that, is that because we don't really want to assign it between the other categories at this point? Because we don't quite know how it's gonna you know, shake out Exactly. So there's two ways to sort of look at this. Um, one is you can show a surplus of, you know, the $2 million we have in contingency, but we tend not to do that. We like to sort of say that's money we anticipate on spending. So it's not okay. like extra. Right. And then it, as the project goes along, things crop up, then, um, you know, that's um, that money will get allocated into their proper line. So that this line here, uh, 6B, it's purely uh, an accounting function, just so it doesn't look like we got a whole bunch of extra money. So, if the um, if the designer contract comes in a little bit over our budget, would we look to pull from here at this stage, or would we wait a little bit to see if there's any other um, savings that pop up in other areas? Um, that's a good question, I and mean, I guess it, it depends on how much 
we end up being over. Um, if it's just a couple thousand dollars, yeah, we'll probably just pull it from somewhere else. Okay. If it's significantly over, then uh, it's not likely we're going to see those savings and other line items. And so then, yeah, we would move. We might want to do it. Okay. Yeah. So we, we will see. And in actuality, I had sent an email to you, Sean, and, and a couple others um, saying, oh, you know, I think that we're already a little bit over. But that email was not accurate. Um, I just realized tonight that we had lumped together two items. One, this uh, design uh, fees and expenses is two point, let's round up to 2.7 million. Um, I had forgotten that we had decided to add into that this um, consultant reimbursables, another 143,000. Okay. And so um, once we get those final pieces from the design team, those final proposals, um, for audiovisual design, lighting design, and actually FF&E design, uh, then we'll be able to see where we are relative to that initial budget. Good, thank you. Certainly. Sean, are you gonna be able to monitor this budget in real time, so to speak? So, um, I think so. Um, so, I, you know, we're gonna approve all the invoices. All the invoices are gonna run through the accounting office. Um, I'll, I have a spreadsheet that I'll, I'll um, adapt from the school project where we right. track expenses by certain categories um so all the all the things that um craig has on there so far we have as well for the collier's uh, invoices and for the cost estimator so um so we can too i'll probably i'm sure craig somehow I'll, I'll have to feed you that information as we um as we pay it so that you can update this report correct um so actually uh one of the services that we provide us, we will also review the invoice. Okay. So all the invoices should come to, to us and you guys, okay. the finance department, and we'll kind of keep parallel books. And then every so often we do like a reconciliation, okay. uh, just to uh, A, make sure that you know where your money is and B, that you know there aren't any accounts. Aren't missing an invoice or something. Yeah, that makes sense, good. So, so that there's works. so many numbers that'll be flying around. I'm sure there'll be something that you know we miscategorize or, or, or you catch or we catch. So that works for you, Sean. Yeah, no, I'll, right. I'll, I'll probably work with Craig to figure out sort of what cat categories things fall into, but no, that makes sense. Great. Other questions about the, the budgeting template? Okay, thank you, Craig. Thank you. And Sean, anything else financial? Uh, the only, only thing, just reiterating what Craig said, which is we're still waiting for FAA to finalize a couple scopes of service for some uh, sort of subcategories of design work. So we don't have anything yet for the, um, sure. for item B. Okay. So I wanted to, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to just uh, ask Sharon to just say a word about the historic tax credits and the proposal that we've got from um, Epsilon. As I said you know, earlier, uh, this proposal will be funded from the fundraising that we're doing for the capital campaign so it's not a jail, not a, not a, not our building. We don't have to worry about it from the particulars of our budget. But would be interested in any uh, thoughts that you have. So Sharon, do you want to say just a little bit about the Epsilon proposal and historic tax credits? Sure. So we've been working with Epsilon pretty close to uh, since the beginning of this project. Uh, they are going to help us apply for the state historic tax credits. Um, and from what I understand, it's a very complicated, time consuming, complicated process. Um, and there are there's several different parts to it. It's several different years. You actually have to submit applications more than once and they ask you to refile. Um, so Epsilon will be helping us with this. Uh, Doug especially is very familiar with our project and our building. Um, so it, it will come out of the, the capital campaign process. And um, yeah, so I think that's the overview. Um, historic tax credits, near as, near as I understand, which would say not a lot, it's not a guarantee that we're going to get historic tax credits. So, uh, but the hope is that we, um, that we can and we will. Uh, and getting them ain't easy. So that's why we are lucky enough to have the possibility of working with um, Epsilon uh, to help us navigate this very complicated, uh, very complicated process. So are there any questions, uh, anything that you didn't understand that Sharon can illuminate about historic tax credits? 
Yeah, sure. Just to clarify, I think I was at a presentation. Um, was it Doug who works for Epsilon? That was Doug Keller. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he did a really good job explaining it. So my understanding is that they're going to help get these credits, which will then contribute to the fundraising initiative that will ultimately Correct. come to the town to fund. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In other words, they're going to sell these credits and we get, we get the money. Okay. And then the money will come into the capital. It's sort of anticipated as part of the money that the library has already pledged and it will come to the town in the usual way as it comes to us. Right. And I think we can announce, um, Austin, if, if I may, that the Jones Library made their first um, contribution uh, the, of the fundraised monies to the town, um, which is really nice. So we've got our first $500,000 in, uh, in that fundraising bucket for the project. I think fabulous is the word. I think it was, it's like um, fabulous. And thank you to the Capital Campaign Committee for the work that it's, um, that it's done that made it possible for the library director to deliver to the town a half a million dollars um, for, this, uh, for this project. Sean, thank you for remembering. And it sounds so much more impressive when you say half a million dollars as opposed to 500,000. Uh, e either either way, it's it's part of the dream come true to see the, this capital campaign making as extraordinary progress as it is making. Okay, no other questions about Epsilon. We will go on to thank you for that, and again, it will be discussed in the uh, by the by the board of trustees of the library. Okay, um, next is Craig, uh, the Collier's project update. Thank you, Austin. All right, so first thing, I'll show you the um, schedule. Great. Okay, so uh, the little red line keeps moving forward. We're now in early <laughs> July. Um, I'll zoom in so we can see where this right. ends. Um, so we are at the tail end of schematic design um, at present. And um, more specifically, um, this past Friday, July 1st, the design team completed their schematic design package, which in includes drawings, narratives, and an outline specification that was distributed to uh, a few key folks over at the town for review. My office will be reviewing that in depth. And we've also um, both um, the towns cost estimating firm, which is RLB, and the design team's estimating firm, Fennessy Consulting Services, um, have received them and have begun their um, cost estimating exercise, which will uh, be a duration of three weeks. At the end of those three weeks, um, we'll bring the two teams together, we'll have a reconciliation meeting. Um, and at that point, we'll have um, the two key documents, which is uh, the, the project that schematic design package, which is a scope and a reconciled cost estimate, which is how much it will we anticipate it will cost. With those two key pieces of information, um, this uh, body here can decide, uh, or you know, the town can decide to proceed to design development, which would begin in early August. So that's what I've got for a schedule update. Does anyone have any questions about that? That's actually sort of schedule. I, I kind of got two things uh, with one stone, project schedule and update on cost estimates. Uh, Craig, could I just ask you about the very last thing that you said? So we get the cost estimates and we've seen the schematic design package. And let's say that the cost estimates are over budget. What is it that uh, the architects or you would do to help uh, at that point uh, the committee to get comfortable with the fact that we're going to be able to do the project within the budget? Great question, Austin. So uh, part of that cost estimating uh, scope of services um, includes a value engineering exercise. Uh -huh. And so we will have, as of uh, July 22nd, or very first thing on July 25th, we'll have that information in hand, and we'll very quickly be able to tell if we're over budget or under budget or just right, 
let, with the assumption that we are, you know, given the the market and everything being very high, we can safely um, guess that it's going to be over budget and there'll have to be some cost reduction. Um, so what we'll do is we'll work with the design team and the two cost estimators that week of the 25th to the 29th, I think, July 25th to 29th, um, and we'll develop a list of value engineering items okay. with a, a costs um, listed as well. And so then we'll be coming to you with, all right, this is you know, the scope that was in the drawings, this is the cost for it, and if we're over, here's a list of things that we, uh, as a as the sort of professionals you guys have hired, recommend to get the cost in line with the budget. Okay, so at that point, we're going to be able to make a determination, uh, even with those cost savings, uh, this project is still viable, it's still going to accomplish its, the program, it's still yep. whatever. Okay, that's and great. If I may, uh, one one more key aspect to that is that value engineering list is not necessarily um, we've got to remove these things and they and they're gone for good. Um, rather, um, some one strategy we can use is okay. Here's an item that could be in the project or could be out of the project, depending mm -hmm. on where the market is a year from now. Mm -hmm. And so those can be, we can strategize to make those right. add alternate or deduct all alternate if the um, client still wants to include them, not, not give up on them yet, that type of thing. Great. Great. Very helpful. Thank you for sure. Okay. Anything else, Craig, on the schedule? Um, one more item, which is, um, sorry, I'm sort of flashing back and forth between <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the agenda and, and my PDFs here, uh, interim location, uh, design update, Sort of, I covered that uh, where we are with the design. Uh, D interim locations um, last week or the week prior, uh, at, towards the end of June, um, Sharon had sent me some uh, more potential locations for the various services. Um, so that's in my court. Uh, one of the things I, I'm going to do uh, soon, sorry, Sharon, is uh, take a look at those and see if there's any kind of like red flags or, or things that I think would, would not work. Um, and I'll, I'll, you know, report those to you. Um, so that, uh, so although I don't have a whole lot of information to provide tonight, um, just the update that we are, you know, still in the um, collecting information portion of uh, the, our time, and uh, the ball is in my court to give some feedback on the um, areas that Sharon has uh, found around town. Great. Thanks. Okay, any questions for Craig and Colliers? Can I just yes. say regarding, I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. I do that, I'm sorry, Sean. Um, regarding the interim spaces, so, you know, the, the possible spaces that we have found does not total how much space that we need, I think. And so I just wanna to say to the people out there, if, there, if you have ideas, um, let us know, send them our way, thank you. Um, ideas about what? Oh, if you know somebody that has available space, send them our way. Hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, Sean? I just wanted to um, confirm, Craig, I think what you said is, so by the end of July or early August, we'll, we'll have a good idea of what strategies we're going to follow to kind of get the, the, if the cost does come in above the budget, back down. Yes. Sort of the, high, the high level things. I know it's not going to be super detailed at this point, but. Yes. And, and so that'll be for the end of July. Okay, great. Thank you. You got it. And uh, Sean, having asked that question, I, I just want to ask Craig, is that exercise uh, kind of uh, a usual exercise in construction projects of this scope? Yes. Yeah, we include that in every uh, every project for every cost estimate. We always include a uh, value engineering exercise. Uh, sometimes you don't need it, um, given the market. We're assuming we will. Yep. Um, but yeah, we that is very typical. So it's not unique to this project. This is a common thing that we're going to go through. Great. Absolutely. Totally fabulous. Okay. Other questions about the Collier's update. I do want to say there again, it's, it's um, uh, 
the milestone of the completion of the schematic design package uh, packet is really worth noting. Um, uh, FAA, with the good help of the Collier's team, uh, has really done a tremendous amount of work um, in getting those schematics to the point where they are now, and uh, some wonderful things like the, the one elevator, which has freed up space and is going to allow them to do some design work on the third floor that's going to make it um, really a, an attractive space up there. So there's a lot of, of, of good work that has already been done and more, of course, to come. Okay, so next item on the agenda is uh, subcommittee reports. Christine for the design subcommittee. Um, yeah, so last time we met was on February, um, on Friday, June 24th. And uh, the big thing then was that FAA had come to talk to us because kind of like what Austin just said, the schematic design is moving forward and they're working very hard at tweaking and tweaking and bringing us information and us asking questions and then going back to go get more information uh, very often about cost or to relook at the drawings and try to rework it um, so that they're in better shape to come to these group um, building committee meetings. So one of those items, uh, the big one was that we had uh, the Civil War tablet space that had been, um, I don't know, deemed um, that uh, FAA had gotten the go ahead to find space for the tablets. And it was uh, great. We had Dave uh, Zomek and um, many members of the Civil War tablet uh, working group come. And so they were looking at the space and um, I think they're, in general, the feeling was that they're pleased to have this space. But as we talked about questions and a design capability, uh, it was sort of realized that some more work needs to be done on them figuring out how these tablets, these gray tablets are gonna be displayed. Are they gonna stay like right now, they're on like these easels on the floor. Um, or should they be put on the walls? And it's not really like, um, you know, what looks better or what people want. Uh, they need to talk to a conservator, um, archival people who can best suggest what is the best way to preserve and keep these tablets um, safe um, yet accessible. So, um, it was really kind of unsure whether they're gonna stay on like floor easels and be in that room or to be mounted on the walls. And you have to keep in mind that like five of the tablets are like 700 pounds each. So that's a lot of weight when you start adding all that. And when we looked at the actual walls of the room, um, part of it is old existing sort of foundation walls that um, you can't uh, structurally like improve as much. And then there's internal walls that are just like standard walls that you know we have around us right now that wouldn't be able to hold numerous 700 pound tablets. So the designers need to know this information they suggested by August would be really what, because if they are gonna go on the wall, um, they need to know that because these walls would structurally have to be engineered in a different way. Um, and whether that costs a little bit more, we didn't get into that, obviously. It's so um, Dave and his group need to do some, I mean, time is of the essence. Um, they have to go figure out how, uh, find someone who can help them. And Sharon, I don't know if you know more about who they can go to, or what's going to happen. Yeah. So um, I don't know if Craig, I'm not sure who follows back up with them. Um, or keeps on top of that, but hopefully they'll be back to us within the month with a decision um, on what to do with that. So, um, and then there were just other general talks about the room and there's potential of switching rooms. Um, there's a room next to it or creating openings between them. So a lot of that is still very fluid and being discussed, but hopefully that will, um, come together in the next month. So then the other part, because we had FAA there, we talked mostly, they, again, they're tweaking these 
uh, drawings, the restrooms, the options they're trying to give us, it mostly impacts just that bottom floor because um, it has the more bathrooms where the, the general bathrooms are, the individual bathrooms are pretty much set. So they brought more of that and they're looking to more costs and the exterior materials they came back with costs. Um, and surprisingly, some of the thing, uh, so we got cost per square foot for the different, whether brick or metal, but they have to come back with more on labor because you can't just like the cost of brick per square foot might be lower than the metal panels, but the metal panels probably take much less labor um, than bricks do. So they're gonna come back with that. And then the last was the elevator. Like you said, Austin is great. And they're working with that one elevator, but they're still tweaking. Uh, walkways and how it ties into that third floor space. So um, they're getting close on that. And because that took um, two hours, we pushed the uh, public comments to the next meeting. So we don't have anything to bring to you today. So, um, and we're not sure we normally meet on Friday, but I think that's gonna get pushed another week or so. We're still figuring out new dates of our next meeting. And that's all I've got. Any questions? Thank you. Questions for the design subcommittee. Craig, th this, do you have any idea what the cost implications would be of mounting the Civil War tablets on the walls of, of the building as opposed to having them mounted in some other way, which doesn't require uh, doing anything particular to the walls to deal with the weight? My understanding is it would not be a great cost. Um, okay, great. Specifically, if we use the new walls, as Christine was mentioning, they can be engineered from day one to mm -hmm. have um, increased capacity. Um, and so it would be it would be the type of thing where you almost wouldn't even notice the cost. Um, maybe you just kind of get uh, blended into the, to the rest of the construction package. Okay. Other questions to the design subcommittee? Uh, again, I want to thank Christine and Sharon uh, in particular for the really good work uh, that happened around the Civil War tablets. Not done. Uh, the, the subcommittee or the committee that's been dealing with the Civil War tablets, uh, really, we owe them again a great deal of thanks for their uh, skilled advocacy and uh, for the, uh, these tablets and their recognition of their significance. Uh, to the town and um, the and their recognition, uh, which we all share, of how valuable it will be to have the tablets um, in 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 the wonderful renovated and added to library. Okay, Alex Lefebvre is not here from the outreach um, committee. Xander isn't here from the outreach committee. Anika isn't here from the outreach committee. I am here from the outreach committee um, to say the outreach committee is doing a fabulous job. And um, newsletters and meetings and public input, which gets um, kind of seamlessly transmitted to Craig and Sharon and then seamlessly uh, uh, evaluated by the design committee. The only other thing that I wanted to say is that uh, tomorrow night at seven o'clock, there'll be an opportunity for members of the public who want to see the latest uh, schematics uh, to see them. So that's a, that is a Zoom meeting tomorrow at, um, at seven o'clock, a community forum. People get a chance to look at those, uh, those, those schematics. Um, so if people can make it, that would be, um, that would be great. Uh, anything else about outreach? Okay. Um, correspondence, there, there really is none that I know of. Topics not anticipated by the chair, none that I know of. Any topics that we need to address? Okay. Uh, there is one before I recognize Bob, there is one thing that I do think we need to address, and that is just to make clear that our next meeting, which is scheduled for the 26th of July at 
is scheduled for the Goodwin Room in the Jones Library. And I take it that going forward, uh, we will continue to meet in the Goodwin Room of the Jones Library for the JLDC meetings. Sharon, is that your intention? That it's open to discussion. I bet Paul has a, 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 a different idea. Uh, so, Paul? Yeah, so uh, the Senate passed a bill today that would extend the ability to meet remotely through December of 2023. Oh. The House hasn't done that. The governor hasn't signed it. So until they both take additional action, that won't happen until we're still in July 15th. I think there's a lot of pressure on them because every city and town is in our same boat. We're scheduling public hearings. We don't know how to schedule them, um, things like that. So, um, you know, if we if we if it doesn't pass, well, by July 26, we'll have def definitive um, what, uh, regulations out. Um, you can still meet remotely. Um, we'll have rules about that in order to meet remotely under our current rules. Uh, you, you have to have a quorum in the room. The chair has to be in the room and then other members can participate via remote means as long as the technology is available to do that. And that's the sort of kicker is the technology being available. Uh, it just lost me around the bend. So um, you're saying that we could meet or I'm going to call it an in-person meeting, but have remote uh, participation. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, so that's currently, you know, pre-pandemic, that was always the case that someone yeah. could call in. Uh, they have to get permission. There's, yeah. We have a set of rules set up to do that. Um, and But the, the, there has to be quorum in the room and the chair has to be in the room. That's the, Those are the two key components of it. Right. But I just want to make, I just want to be clear about what people's dispositions are. If the governor allows us to continue to meet fully remotely, is it people's preference that we would, con or that we could meet in person? Is it people's preference that we continue to meet fully remotely? George? Um, I mean, I'm of the mindset, given that these meetings involve people from all different areas of the state, and that we do a lot of screen sharing with uh, with so many things. It just seems to be more practical to meet remotely if we are able to, but I certainly understand if the laws prohibit that, but it just seems to me that it's a lot, it's a lot more practical to meet remotely given the, the scope of this project. So other thoughts, assuming that we, if right, Paul, if the law is passed and signed, we would have to make a decision about remote meeting. And I want to make sure that we're we're making that decision now in case that we have that alternative. Right. So, yeah, Christine. Yeah, I'm just wondering, do we, so do we still have to video all of our meetings or how does that work? Because I know that if we are in person, are they still gonna be videoed? What is the town's practice likely to be, Paul? I mean, prior to the pandemic, we didn't video any, we weren't, Amherst Media covered the Finance Committee, the School Committee, and the Select Board. They didn't cut uh, other and meetings. Planning Board. Video. Yeah. And Planning Board, I guess, maybe, yeah. But they didn't cover other meetings. And I think the public has gotten used to the availability of these things on via Zoom, where yeah. we record everything via Zoom. That's one yeah. of the big advantages. There are compromises on both ends. You know, if you if we try to meet in person, then there's technology demands that if every committee wanted to meet in a hybrid technology, which is what the select board, or which what the council does, um, we would not be able to support that through our IT department for every committee to do that. Yeah, Sharon. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I wanted to follow up on what Paul just said. So, so going back to pre-pandemic, meeting in person, the majority of us, that will, that will work fine, but remember, so there are forms you have to fill out if you do not want to be in the room. I, I, I think you need to state a reason, and there's an approval process, uh, and Paul can clarify if I'm wrong. So it's not easy to not be in the room. Um, and so by doing it in the Goodwin room and the library, 
we cannot, the library can't support a hybrid model. I think, and happy to talk more with Paul, the benefit of doing it in the Goodwin room is then we're not battling with all the other town departments for the town room at town hall. The town room at town hall does have the, the IT capabilities, but the Goodwin room is just plain old basic. We're in the space. Um, nothing will be recorded. So I just wanted to try to lay out all the options. So are there other thoughts about uh, the, the, Zoom, the Zoom meeting? I will just say for myself, uh, I hope that we would continue to meet via Zoom if we're able to. Uh, we might want to schedule occasional in-person meetings, but I find that the Zoom uh, meeting format allows people to participate, doesn't inconvenience them, members of the public, we can record it. Uh, and as George said, there's a lot of the screen sharing, looking at diagrams and things, uh, which is pretty easy with Zoom. George? Um, yeah, I mean, I was just I was just going to add, because I, I wanted to mention that as well. There's, there's probably a lot of members of the public who are yet to be comfortable coming to a meeting and being amongst a crowd of people. So for, for a lot of the members of the public, it's easier for them to tune in via Zoom as well, because they feel safer. So um, does anybody want to say anything against the idea of continuing to meet via Zoom if the governor allows it? OK, so let's, uh, let's Sharon, um, Angie, let's check in about the progress of that legislation. It, uh, the meeting is right now scheduled to be in person. If the legislation passes, the governor signs it. Uh, let's uh, make sure that the meeting is on Zoom. Sharon? Yeah, I just wanted to say one more thing. So based on what happened last time, it literally, it was like the day before. And as you all know, you, we have to post 48 hours in advance. So I'm guessing we should assume that this is going to happen in the Goodwin room on the oh. what uh, the 26th. I, I think we should assume that um, because I don't. I could be wrong. Maybe they'll come back on Friday and they'll give us loads of time. But well, I, I, the answer to the question is stay tuned. So right, the, the meeting is now scheduled for the to be in person, to be in the Goodwin room. Stay tuned. That may may change or may not change. Okay, so next item on the agenda, we have three, seven members of the public. Uh, now is an opportunity for public comment and I see Bob Pam. My question is fairly simple. Um, tomorrow when the uh, new schematics are being unveiled to the public, Will they then be available online in some fashion so that if you need to print it out and review it, you can do so? Yeah, so yeah. To, to clarify the uh, schematics, they were revealed a couple weeks ago and they are on the website and uh, the schematic design package uh, has been sent to us released and and is being put on the website. So I think if you go to the Jones Library's website, you'll see it now. Great. Thank you, Bob. All right, Bob, if you would lower your hand, that would be great. Um, other, any other public comment? Okay, seeing none, thanking members of the public for attending the meeting. The last item is adjournment and I'm gonna deploy the Bachelman move and just say, we're adjourned. Stay well, everybody. Look Thank forward you. to seeing you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. You all.